And welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most interesting topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 140th edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 532nd episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, September 26, 2019. I am your host tonight, Brian Tonsoni, a.k.a. The Coach. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call, how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call. And that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moments. This week's banner moment occurred on Tuesday when the 2019-2020 Indiana Hoosiers were made available to answer questions on Media Day. We heard Trace Jackson Davis talk about concentrating on team chemistry, Devontae Green willing to take on the responsibility of scoring for the team, and also heard about more movement away from the ball on offense. Robert Finnessy discussed having a more aggressive mindset, Plus, you have to love Joey Brunk and his leadership saying, quote, I am comfortable with who I am and don't have any problem talking and speaking, unquote. Those takeaways plus a few more were key parts of Media Day. However, one moment and one player really stood out. This week's banner moment is all about Jerome Hunter. The team released a statement saying that Jerome is totally cleared for all basketball activities and that due to HIPAA laws, they could not reveal any more information other than that the injury will be watched and monitored going forward. Recently, a physical therapist had mess- messaged me with his thoughts on Jerome. He believed, from looking at things from the outside and no direct observation, that Jerome could play but may have some minutes restricted as the team monitors his recovery. He explained what he thought was wrong with Jerome and stated that it should not affect his ability to play the game of basketball, and the media day information confirmed this belief. This is great news. First, for the young man himself. Sitting out for a year is tough in any set of circumstances, but when an injury with great complications is the cause, doubt may have creeped in about his future. Jerome even stated, quote, last year really hurt, Uh, unquote. The news is also great for the Indiana basketball program. Jerome is a versatile player who can score the basketball and defend several positions. He will need some time to get back up to speed on the court, but Jerome's positive attitude and love for the game will allow him to be a huge part of this team. Jerome commented saying, quote, as you keep getting through it, you start thinking of other things and how you can get better off the court. That's all I focused on, how next year I could be the best player I could be, unquote. Well, it looks like next year is here for Jerome Hunter. Welcome back, Jerome. We are all excited to see you on the court. More importantly, we are glad you are recovering and can pursue your dream. And welcome back to all the Hoosier players. It's time to go to work. Okay, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show, which in rare occurrence does not include Jared, Andy, or Ryan. Instead, we have two special guests who you will be very familiar with. First to my left, he is Hoosier Nation's most anonymous yet popular superfan. He is Zach Osterman's co-host on Mind Your Banners, and he is the president emeritus of the T. John Job Fan Club. I've got photos of T. John with an elephant now. Chronic, what are your IU basketball thoughts as the offseason speeds ever closer to Hoosier hysteria? Well, for, first, first, let me state, state the record. record. Zach is, is a, well, I co-host. Zach is... He's a host, too. I don't like him taking top billing regardless. Nevertheless, he's the one that actually shows up on time, so I guess we'll let him have it. Uh, to, to the question, though, I'm, I'm excited as you can expect to be uh, seeing where the Hoosiers have come, uh, where we expect them to be going forward in year three of Archie's uh, tenure here. I, I think it's a lot of opportunity. It's, it's one of those high-risk, high-reward seasons where I think there's a lot on the table for the program and, and for the players themselves individually. There's a whole lot of, uh, of opportunity, I think, for guys to really uh, stake a claim as, as, as you know, important, meaningful, and, and hopefully transitional Indiana basketball players that kind of get the program back to where the fan base would like to see it be at this point. And to my right, he is the godfather of IU Sports Podcasting, the head of IU Sports Media Department, and the man who completed his dissertation by power ranking Bloomington Pizza Options. Yes, it is the sultan of the subtweet himself, Galen Clavio. Galen, what's on your mind this evening? 
Uh, that that's a tremendous intro. I need to send Jared some extra money in, in this week's royalty check. Uh, no, you know what? I'm just excited that we have storylines. We have something new to talk about with IU basketball. I was I was thinking about this with IU football in August. I was just so excited that practice was back and that we could have something to focus on and something that once games got going, we could really you know get a sense of how the team was. And I think with basketball, we need it even more so because, frankly, even though last year's regular season ended fairly well, uh, I think the overall ending of the season wasn't what anybody wanted, and, and we've just had a bunch of time to sit around and stew in those juices. And so the fact that Hoosier Hysteria is this early, the fact we've already heard from the players and from uh, Coach Miller from Media Day, I think it's great. And, and you know, the, the nice thing is it's a nice kind of slow on-ramp to the season. We had an exhibition game. But, you know, that's, I think, a month from tonight. Uh, and and then we get some games right after that. So uh, it should be a really fun next month here, I think. Well, thank you guys for joining me uh, as, as a host. Without any of the three regulars, I couldn't ask for a, a better panel to talk a little bit of basketball. And here's what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to run through a few Hoosier headlines. We'll look ahead to what are we looking for that will show us improvement in a variety of uh, – areas in Indiana basketball, and then we'll answer your questions in segment three. All of that coming this week on Assembly Call Radio. But first, let's talk about tickets. You have a lot of options when it comes to where you get your sports tickets, and this isn't an industry that is typically known for its growth, innovation, and customer friendliness. But with millions of live event tickets and a price match guarantee, SeatGeek proves that there's a better way. They built the fastest way to find tickets so that you can stop searching for the perfect seat and instead start enjoying it. Just look at the App Store. SeatGeek has over 50,000 five-star reviews, and the reason is because they deliver a better process for buying tickets. SeatGeek pulls together millions of tickets from all over the web, and then they rate each other, uh, each deal on a scale of 1 to 10 with a color-coded system to show the value. Green dots mean good deals, red dots are overpriced. Then they display the tickets on an interactive seat map so you can see right where they are. And every purchase is fully guaranteed so you can shop for tickets with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone because it's by far the fastest and easiest way to find tickets. And I've already started looking for those random nights when I can make it down to Bloomington to look for tickets. I've already been pricing out several games using the SeatGeek app. Get a brother, get some coupons. Yeah, Chronic, you can get some coupons. And best of all, SeatGeek will give you $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. All you need to do is use our promo code. So download the SeatGeek app today and use promo code ASSEMBLY for $10 off on your purchase. That's promo code ASSEMBLY for $10 off your first purchase. Okay, here are some Hoosier headlines that have happened in the Past week, IU hosted Media Day on Tuesday for the players, and Archie, Medi- Archie Miller was made available to the media on Wednesday. Andre Curbelo keeps IU in his top five, and the social media chatter uh, recently is of Dar- Dawson Garcia possibly making an official visit on Hoosier Hysteria and some recruiting news with uh, other teams that were looking at Garcia that may have led to uh, some positive vibes for Indiana. So, uh, Galen, we'll, we'll turn to you. What what headlines happened this week that really grabbed your attention? Well, I think you mentioned it off the top. The, the one that really grabbed my attention was was the Jerome Hunter news that he was going to be cleared. As far as the the recruiting stuff is concerned, though, I mean, I think certainly the uh, you know the Garcia news is is interesting, and you know, it, I'm really fascinated by a couple of things. First of all, how Archie Miller continues to try to build this roster and the sorts of players that he seems to be going after, both in terms of, uh, I guess, positionally speaking, and to some degree in terms of almost a a disregard for worrying about what like the the national rankings are. This has been something that I've seen a lot of IU fans, I think, over obsess about, Uh, you know, the, the fact that the recruits he's brought in and gotten verbals from so far aren't ranked above a certain number. And and yet you look at the way that many of the teams that have had success getting to the final four and beyond uh, over the course of the last few years have recruited. Uh, they've followed a pattern that I don't think is dissimilar to what Archie Miller is doing right now. I mean, focusing on fit, 
focusing on greatest need and focusing on how things are going to mesh together maybe two years from now. Uh, you know, I use not in the same realm as Duke and Kentucky when it comes to the type of recruits that they're going to be able to pull in or that they want to pull in. And, you know, I, frankly, I think even if you take the injury factor of the Romeo Langford recruitment out of it last year, I think that there was there needed to be a lot more team under the recruitment of Romeo Langford, even if he had been healthy, for that to be a, a fully effective recruit. And, and I think Archie Miller maybe has realized that. Uh, and I mean, granted, you're not going to not recruit Romeo Langford if the opportunity is available, but that almost looks like a blip on the radar. And what we're seeing, uh, you know, in terms of the news and in terms of the the way that the recruiting process has gone so far has really been, I think, a pretty logical approach to team building in the current collegiate environment. You know, I I – I agree with you on that. I like those guys. We heard a lot about chemistry in a lot of the interviews. And uh, last year, I thought there was, at times, uh, there wasn't a, a mental toughness or or that, that competitiveness that you would think that an Archie Miller-led team would have. And that, I just thought it was personnel. And so he's recruiting a lot of those guys who want to dive on the floor, do those extra things, and then develop them in. And the question then eventually will be, how do you sprinkle in that superstar talent, as you mentioned, get that base uh, of a team there and then throw a superstar in? Or do you need, or do you develop the superstar? I Correct. mean, you know, it's like you've got, uh, you know, it's like Calvert Chaney is going into the, uh, the, you know, the hall of fame, I think back in his hometown uh, later in November. And uh, I mean, that was not a guy who you would have pegged as a superstar coming out of college. I mean, you know, so much of, what we get tied up in with recruiting is what are people rated right now? And there's certainly some bona fide talent. I just don't think I use it a juncture from a, a, a program building perspective where they can plug a guy in like that and, and have him play at that caliber and have the team around him to support that. But they can certainly develop people. And that's what I'm really looking to see. And I think that's what Archie Miller and his staff are going to have to do if they're going to be successful over these next few years. And, and we'll get to that in, in the next se- segment, things we're looking for uh, to, to mark that improvement. Chronic, um, who's your headlines? What's on your mind this week about Indiana basketball? I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page as Galen. I think probably the biggest news this week, uh, not just that Jerome Hunter is healthy and cleared to play, that I think on even the, the broader scale that the entire team made it through the off season, a healthy, uh, b without any you know without any negative incidents taking place. Uh, I think that's usually you know the best case scenario, considering where the team's been both in the short as well as the not so short term. Uh, I think we did be foolish take for granted that you get through the off season with everybody available, hopefully everybody better uh, than where they left the season last year. Um, so I think that is that's tremendously important for this team, especially considering some of the uh, the challenges they're going to face. Uh, you need all hands on deck, and and you need everybody playing it, you know, maximizing your potential here as they as they grow and develop uh, within the program. Um, I, I, I think along those same lines, though, that Galen mentioned, you know, it's probably best case scenario as well on the recruiting front. The fact that Archie continues to to maintain the momentum that he had, I think that was the biggest risk to the program. Um, after last season's, you know, abrupt end was where, where does that leave you? Obviously it's a critical year. You've had, um, you know, your top rank recruit in, in a oh, decade in, in Romeo, how do you follow that up? Especially after the disappointment, does that turn a lot of these guys off? Um, you know, and I, I think circling back to, to even before Archie came on, one of the questions that I know Galen and I asked, and I know I, I probably espoused this in most conversations at the time, you know, I wondered if Indiana was ever going to be in the place where they could hire another Bob Knight again, a younger coach, somebody that's, you know, that's had some success, but not a big name, you know, not a high dollar ticket, but someone who, you know, based off their acumen, based off, you know, their, their skill, you see the potential there and you're willing to take that risk. And obviously in Archie, I think you got somebody who's really close to that along those lines though. Now that we're a couple of years down the road with Arch, we're now at the point too, where I guess the question then becomes, can the IU fan base take, the type of program building that, that a coach like that's going to bring. And, and I think when you look at Bob Knight's success, obviously he's, he's a brilliant mind. Um, all that being said, though, he doesn't achieve what he does unless he recruits the right players for his particular system, for the style of basketball he wants to play, um, that can play together within a system like that. Uh, and I think that's every bit as important as the guy pulling the levers is, is who he's plugging in those spots to effectuate those plans. So 
I, I guess that's kind of where Indiana finds themselves right now. And, and I, I do agree with Galen that I, I think, you know, recruiting off of need and fit uh, rather than just chasing stars is absolutely essential, both, you know, it, it, in Indiana's situation right now. But I think in the, in the bigger picture, when you look at how some of the more successful programs um, have been able to thrive in this one and done era when they're not necessarily living and dying with the one and done type players, uh, I, I think that's important. Um, but I think it's also important that, it, you know, that Indiana fans at least are patient enough to recognize a part of that, though, is the patience is going to be tested, can only be tested so long. Eventually, you're going to have to win games with these guys. And I think that's where the importance of, uh, of year three really starts to heighten, uh, because now, you know, not only are we, are we looking what's this season look like? Well, how's this going to enable your success in season four and season five and going down the road and continuing to build? And uh, I, I, I like where the program's at. I, I think, again, it's probably best case scenario. Uh, considering some of the disappointment of last season, um, you know, but going back to my my biggest takeaway from from this week, I think a lot of that will remain contingent on this team being able to stay healthy throughout the season because I, I also see a roster, uh, at least on paper right now, with what we know and what we've seen, that is a couple, you know, a, a key injury here or there away from having some really really significant challenges, kind of like what we saw last season. So you both brought up an interesting point about the recruiting and building. I'm going to throw you this question back. We'll start. We'll go back with Chronic first. How long do you think it takes a, a coach? You know, there's been some comparisons to other programs and coaches starting off and having a, a faster start. And I, I know we've all talked about, you know, if it's a similar coach that takes over, it's easier than than maybe a Tom Crean to Archie Miller. But in general, Chronic and then Galen, how do you guys feel about how long should we be patient or how long does it take a coach to really build his program the way he wants it to be and then be continuously successful? That's a tough one. I think the short answer is it, it depends. Um, you know, generally speaking, I think whenever you look at a program, there's always that mark where there comes a point where, where the current coach, he's got all his guys in there. You know, there's no longer holdouts from the prior regime. Um, and I think you also have to look at exactly what did he inherit when he came into the program and, and, you know, how did that facilitate that transition into whatever program was trying to be built? And obviously, there was there were some challenges on the roster that he inherited. There were some challenges on the way that the um, the program was kind of balanced as far as scholarships were concerned, uh, as far as the talent that he inherited. Uh, you know, just holding together that initial recruiting class of uh, Al and Justin and Clifton, um, you know, that was no small feat in and of itself. Just keeping, you know, Tom's guys signed up and on board, he basically had to go re-recruit them. Um, I think with Archie and, and where he's trying to go here, I, I think realistically, I, I, I you kind of look at, I, I don't think this is necessarily the year, but I think by next year, you should expect this program to be in a position where, you know, this isn't missing the tournament's not really an acceptable option. I don't, you know, I, I don't want to get too full of myself and Indiana fans love to, to point to that. Well, we should never miss the tournament. Well, in a perfect world, they never would. But when you look at the way the program's been managed, it's very easy to understand how it's happened uh, repeatedly uh, as of late, while also, you know, in, in subsequent seasons having a lot of success and then finding themselves, you know, back struggling again. So transitioning away from that type of a cycle, uh, getting into the point, though, where you've got an identity that's been established. I mean, I'm still looking forward to seeing this team play and, and, and say that, 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 you know, that five minute stretch right there, that's the way Archie's offense is supposed to look. I think we got a pretty good idea what the defense is supposed to look like. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what this team is is supposed to be offensively. And I, I think part of the, the challenge, at least as far as getting arms around this this offense and what Archie's really trying to do is the pieces have kind of been so scattered at times, it really hasn't been a cohesive uh, construction. Um, and I think as, as he gets to the point where he has all of his guys in the roster and he's, he's specifically recruiting for immediate needs, uh, in this class and subsequent classes that I think that's part of his effectiveness as, as a program manager is, you know, putting those pieces together in a way that there is cohesion, that there is continuity from year to year, uh, even when you lose a senior class, uh, but more than anything that they can continuously be effective. So I, I, I think in, in, you know, next year. By the end of the next year, we should have a pretty good idea uh, whether or not this thing is going to float. I, I agree, and I hope you're right. Galen, your thoughts on, on how long does it take a, a coach? I know there's many factors, but in your opinion? Yeah. It depends on, I think, what you inherited. It also depends on if you make mistakes in the first few years. I mean, I think you can look at someone like Chris Beard and say, 
he didn't make any mistakes. I mean, he the first year they didn't make the tournament, and then this year two and year three have been pretty remarkable. Um, you know, but I mean, you can look at some very successful coaches that where it took three, four, maybe even five years for it to really get going. I mean, John Beeline at Michigan, great example of that. Uh, Tony Bennett, who I think has been brought up on several occasions, a good example of that. Uh, you know, even, I mean, Bruce Pearl, and everybody laughs when you say Bruce Pearl, but, you know, I mean, whatever you think the methodology is that he has gotten Auburn up and running, it took him three years to get to the tournament, and, and now they seem to be going along at a pretty good clip. So, you know, look, I think Archie Miller made some mistakes. I think that the, you know, for whatever the reason was that he decided he needed to honor the commitments of the guys that were recruited in that 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 orphan class uh, that Crean had brought in and then got fired uh, before it got to play, uh, you know, I mean, that that class hasn't quite worked out, and it's certainly not a, a bedrock sort of class. I mean, one member isn't even there. And then in his first recruiting class, I think there were some uh, some guys that, well, I mean, one of them is, is has now transferred, and then there have been a couple of others that have been somewhat slow to start. And that's Look, that happens. It's normal. I'm, I don't think there's necessarily an overt amount of criticism that needs to take place as a result of that. But if those things happen, that's going to delay the process a little bit. Uh, you know, the, what ends up affecting things beyond that is is their panic. And I think at a place like Indiana, there's going to be some exterior panic on the part of fans because fans don't understand why it can't happen immediately. And look, I mean, after 20 some years of uh, of, of a lot of false starts and a lot of, uh, you know, accidentally downshifting from third into first uh, or even lower than that, uh, I can see why people would be looking at this and, you know, kind of scratching their heads or rolling their eyes and saying, all right, maybe this isn't going to work after all. I, everything, like all the intangible elements seem to be pointing, and we talked about the recruiting earlier, we talked about, I think, you know, the fact that they've established defense as a calling card. I mean, all of those things point in the right direction. Um, and I agree with Chronic. I think the idea that I actually think this year we're going to get a really good sense of what a replacement level Archie Miller team is going to look like, uh, you know, because this team kind of missing offensive stars, but certainly with guys that know how to play defense, uh, you know, this is going to be where we see what IU does when they don't have a, a particular spot on the floor. They're trying to get the ball to every single time down. And you know, this will be, you know, a uh, the kind of the, the base chassis model, I think, for IU. And, I, and, and probably a lot more so than the first two years. I just don't know if we really learned that much or could have learned that much out of the first two years, other than that, you know, the things can go wrong with Archie Miller coach teams. And, and I don't think that's a particularly huge revelation. Okay, coming up on the assembly call, we're going to break down what to watch for early in the season from players, coaches, the offense, and the defense. Improvement is a must. How will we know that the program direction is in a positive by what we see on the court? We'll discuss next here on the Assembly Call. What's going on? It's Christian Wofford. What's the only thing better than an epic buzzer beater? Celebrating it with friends afterwards. Join my guys, Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU game. Go Hoosiers. Thank you, Christian, and welcome back to the assembly call. You can find all of our content on, at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to join the chat mob during our unedited live broadcast or watch those replays and see all the between-the-segment banner, check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash assemblycall. I'm the coach, Brian Tonsoni, here with this week's special guest hosts, Chronic Hoosier and Galen Clavio, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we're looking for uh, on the court uh, with this Indiana basketball program at Hoosier Hysteria and in the early uh, season games in November. How are we going to see that improvement that Indiana fans are longing for? And Galen, we'll start with you on, on personnel what kind of signs are you looking for uh, with, with the personnel that we have, the 11-man roster, that'll tell you that this program is on the upswing? I think a lot of it's going to come down to uh, how they decide to roll out uh, their, their basically top seven or top eight rotation. And I, when I look at the, the roster right now, it's 
it's going to be interesting because so much of it hinges on a couple of things. One is obviously Jerome Hunter's health and, you know, he's cleared for basketball activity and that's great. What does that mean? How does that translate to the floor? Uh, you know, if you look at a uh, Bart Torvik's website, which I highly recommend for all basketball fans, it's like Ken Palm on like the best steroids possible. Uh, you can see he's got Jerome Hunter projected at about five points a game. I think he could, probably almost double that. Uh, I think he's got the shooting and scoring ability and he's got the versatility. And that's something that we've, we've heard uh, talked about in media day, you know, if they, if they're moving him around and they're getting him out there and he's able to play, you know, 20 to 25 minutes a game, if not more than that, I think that's a really good sign for IU. Uh, You know, I think him and Al Durham are going to be plugging several different holes. You know, when, when IU wants to go big and we've read about that, Zach Osterman had a piece in the Indy star uh, you know, that's going to be important. And then we can roll a 6'4 or a 6'6 guy out there at the two, and you're, you've are you got Joey Brunk and, and you've got Justin Smith and maybe you got Trace Jackson Davis or or, Tra- or Deron Davis out there. That's a that's a good look against certain teams. And then if they can roll back and go a little bit smaller and they can roll Hunter over to the three and have Finnessy and Green in the backcourt, there's a lot of potential versatility. So I'm looking at that, and I think you're going to have to have a regular rotation at the five between Brunk, Jackson Davis, and Davis. Like all three of those guys are going to have to perform. And I think the best case statistical scenarios for IU, particularly offensively, are kind of relying on all of them to be able to perform. Uh, you know, the 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 ability of Deron Davis to play a, a respectable number of minutes on a night in night out basis is going to be huge. Can he get through an entire season without injury? Uh, you know, can his stamina last for the entire four years? He's had a lot of tough injury issues and I think he's just got a body that's kind of, uh, you know, at war with itself. And and this is probably, I don't, I don't know how many more effective years of basketball he's got just because of all the injuries that he's had. But if we can get one more year where he plays a, at a really good level, I think that's a huge a potential positive for IU. And I think the last piece for me, how much do you get out of the two guys I haven't mentioned so far, Armand Franklin and Demise Anderson? Demise Anderson, I think, had a very disappointing year last year. He would certainly uh, probably say that uh, as, as much as anybody. It was it was a struggle for him to, to find time in the court and to stay on the court. He only played in 21 games. Uh, he, his, his shooting from outside was not very good. Uh, and Armand Franklin, I think, has a possibility of coming in and contributing. It's just a matter of what does that look like for the SIU team. So that's I kind of talked about everybody there, but those are the things I think that we got to look at the most. I, I think it will be interesting the the rotation at the five. You know who who gets who starts and and who comes off the bench and are there matchup situations at the five? I do think that personnel decision is going to be very uh, interesting. Um, f- to, to watch chronic your, your thoughts on personnel what are you looking for what would you like to see and that's going to tell you hey we're he- we're headed as indiana fans in the right direction personnel wise i think the biggest thing right off the bat is i'm looking to see leadership uh you know the one of the the biggest obstacles that this roster faces is you know we can talk about scoring and and, and what a huge void in the offense that langford and morgan created with their departure that was 45 percent uh, you know, they average 32 points a game combined. That's 45% of IU's average on any given night. Um, but I, I think beyond that, even more important than that right now, because I think scoring, if you know, if the offense is being run effectively, can be spread around. It's not like everybody's got to jump their average, you know, 10 points per game in order to make up for that. Uh, you know, if your rotation players each average, say, three points higher than where they had previously, I think you, you've plugged that gap nicely. But more than anything, I want to see who is willing to lead this team. Um, and I'm not just talking about grabbing guys by the jersey and getting in their face when they screw up. Uh, who's willing to lead this team by example? Who's willing to be the guy uh, that gets the stops when they need him? Who's going to be the guy that's getting on the floor for the loose balls? You know, who's going to be the guy that this team looks to that sets the tone? Uh, I think this is a roster that's screaming for for leadership. Um, they need to see some alphas out there. And when you just look at, you know, from a, a class perspective, you've got two seniors um, and, and Deron Davis and, and, um, and Devante, and you know those those guys can they can certainly they they can exert their will on the game, but it's not always necessarily in a positive manner. And how they kind of manage that new role that they found themselves in, you know, I, I think they can both be really really special players for this team. Um, 
but understanding that role, playing within that role, and also at the same time bringing guys up as you elevate yourself, bringing your teammates up with you, I think is going to be absolutely imperative. Uh, and then I guess kind of on the micro, it's there's a whole, there's a whole lot of questions about how this team is going to score the bucket. Um, you know, one one thing statistically I'm looking at really really closely is can we get above 65 percent from the free throw line? Uh, and, and for the life of me, I don't understand. Is that allowed? What, I don't know, and I, I'm still trying to figure out. I've got some theories what's vexed this team New uh, math. because they've they've pretty <laughs> consistently been at 65 percent and some change uh, underneath Archie. Now, what was important was last year they brought the opponents down even lower than that. Um, you know, my, my running hypothesis is Archie's style of defense, the pack line, uh, the pace at which he likes to play his offense, it's just sapping these guys' legs. Uh, if that's true, uh, maybe with a little bit more time, you know, experience in the system, uh, with conditioning that kind of accounts for that, maybe these shooters will have their legs underneath them. I think part of it's schematic, and I think a big part of it's personnel as well. Um, but when you look at the baseline metrics is can this team shoot the ball better? There's one controlled shot in the entire game, and that's from the charity stripe. And, you know, even if you're you're missing a, a clear cut, this is your number one shooter on this roster, there's no reason that that giving the the issues that free throw shootings cause this team, that this isn't something that can be correctable. Uh, and this isn't something that we can see some pretty marked quantifiable statistical improvement in. So, Chronic, you bring up a, a, a great point. As a coach myself, you try to coach leadership and, and bring leadership out of people. Let me ask both of you. I'll start with you, Chronic. Um, who would you think is the best um, vocal leader, could potentially be the best vocal leader? And, and who would be that person who leads by example that's just really tough in the drills and, and diving on the floor and, and leading by example? And, and in our high school program, you would like that to be upperclassmen, but sometimes your upperclassmen aren't necessarily those dudes. Um, and when you look at this roster, so who, who's that vocal leader that you think is going to uh, shine this year? And who, who's that, that person that with their play leads the Indiana Hoosiers? I'm looking at Finnessy. I mean, that's your point guard. That's your floor leader. Uh, that's the one guy who really impressed upon me. He's got a bulldog mentality. I mean, the way that he gets in guys' faces defensively, uh, the way that he can attack off the dribble, at least when he was healthy, the explosiveness that he has. Uh, but just his tenacity. Uh, he's he's something to handle. And he's he's as tough of a, of a player as I think we've seen under Archie so far. Um, I, I think that's your guy. I think the position he plays makes him a natural fit for it. Um, you know, he seemed like at least through some of those healthy portions last year, a guy that really didn't have a problem exerting himself on the floor. And, you know, it was more of a quiet leadership as a freshman, as you would expect. Uh, but just his willingness to get in there and get his nose dirty. I think that's the guy. And, you know, obviously you look at the upper class, but I think Joey Brunk brings, um, a tremendous asset, just having been through multiple seasons now, uh, up at Butler where he's, he's, he's got to experience pretty much everything that a senior would at this point as far as just the rigors of college Division one basketball, uh, you know, major conference basketball at that. And, you know, honestly, I think he's one of those guys that's probably going to be a star in the post. So whenever you've got a guy that, you know, not only can he, he um, kind of fill in some of those spaces in the locker room, uh, but can go out there and give the meaningful minutes, can get the stops, can get the buckets that your team needs. Because I, I think that's – that's probably with the the third base thing I'm looking for is who's the fail safe option. You know, when the offense is broke down and the shot clock's expiring, uh, you know, they had a tremendous um, dump down guy in Juwan Morgan. He was such a creative score, scorer under the basket that he he saved them a lot of uh, a, a lot of issues really clicking. They don't have that this year. So who who is the guy that when the shot clock's going down that you try to dump the ball down to and, and hope for the best? Uh, I think Joey could could be that guy for this team. Galen, talking about Joey Brunk, uh, we've heard a lot of leadership, a, a lot of uh, talk in the locker room and on the court from Joey Brunk. How easy or difficult is it for a guy to be a transfer uh, and come into a program and, and, and be a leader, and, and is that going to be effective? I don't think it's easy, and I don't think it's going to be effective. I, I think it – like this is – I guess when I think about – this team and how it's going to set up as much as I would like to agree with chronic that the answer to this question is Rob Finnessy. I think in reality, the answer to this question, probably both questions is Devonte green. 
for better or for worse, in as much as Green is going to be the leading scorer on this team, almost certain. I'd say there's probably like a four in five chance that that's the case. He is a four year senior. He's a guy that has, you know, obviously had some troubles in terms of, of how he's meshed with the team at times. And yet he might be the most talented natural scorer on the team. And I think you look down the rest of the roster and, you know, I mean, Al Durham, nice guy, but seems like a role player. Justin Smith, I just don't think he's got it in his personality to assert himself in that way. You know, Jerron Davis, same thing. Trace Jackson Davis is a freshman. Jerome Hunter is coming off a major injury. And I think he's still trying to find himself on the collegiate level. And Finnessy is a guy who, while I, I certainly liked his play, and I think he's definitely a play-by-example sort of guy, there's an alpha dog uh, mentality that has to affect somebody in the backcourt. And I have a hard time seeing a four-year senior starter ceding that to a sophomore point guard. I just it doesn't seem to jive with me. I mean, even during media day, we're hearing about Devontae Green handling the ball and also coming off of screens and, and like doing all of these things. The, I, to me, if you're going to be the focal point like that, you're also going to be the leader. And I don't know what that looks like for this IU team. I think that last year, how much people want to admit it or not, but there seemed to be a battle for the controls of the airplane. And it was like a three way battle. And, and one of the people battling wasn't a player. Um, and you know, now maybe that's been cleared up and maybe everybody's pointing in the right direction, but we still have to actually see it in action and see it work for me to get really comfortable with it. Hence a lot of the talk of chemistry and, and toughness and all of those things in the recruiting and in the, in the media day. And, and, and we always say too, your, your best player, um, better be your hardest worker and best leader. And, and that goes to the Devontae Green conversation there, that it's if you're going to be the, the dude who's getting 15 points, you ought to better be leading. And that could go the other way, too, as we've seen uh, Devontae have good Devontae and, and bad Devontae. Let's, let's transition here to offense. What, what kind of things are we looking for that will say, you know what, this offense looks a little bit better than what we've seen in the past. Galen, what, what, would, you like, what would you like to see or what are you looking for or both? Well, I mean, I I will uh, fall in line with Chronic a little bit and say I'd love to see some free throw shooting. I mean, that was really – you can afford, I think, to not shoot the ball, you know, great from the three-point line if you're shooting the ball well from two-point, which they did last year. They they shot 53% from two, and you're shooting the ball – at the median level or better from the free throw line. I mean, last year, it wasn't just that they shot 65% from the free throw line. It was that that was 328th in the country. And and that just can't be. So, uh, you know, I I have to think the three-point shooting is going to get better. Now, granted, we said that last year, and, you know, we were coming off of a historic worst three-point shooting performance in 2018, and it actually somehow managed to get, what, like a full percentage point worse in 2019. Uh, so there has to be maybe maybe it's just a, a bounce back somewhat close to the mean. But I really think that's what it comes down to, because if you look at if you look at IU from an offensive efficiency perspective, they actually were slightly better last season than they were the season before. And and much of that you know came down to shooting the ball from two a little bit better and and also turning the ball over slightly less. So I guess that would be the other category. You know, they drop their turnover percentage a smidge. They're turning it over under 18% of the time. If they can drop that down to like 15% of the time, uh, then suddenly they're not wasting as many possessions. They're being more efficient. If they can get that offensive efficiency cranked up to where it's in the like the, the 50s, uh, as far as the national ranking is concerned, I, I think that that's where this team – is in serious contention to win 20, 21, 22 games. So, Chronic, I heard uh, as an old man myself, I, I heard that there might be a little more of an old man game being played with the size that Indiana uh, – and, and that kind of makes this old man uh, smile a little bit. Do you think that the old man game, a little more motion offense, A, will please Indiana fans and, as Galen said, make the offense a little more efficient? And, and then add what – Again, what are you looking for uh, to see in, in this year's offense? There's the nostalgic piece of me that absolutely loves the concept. There's the uh, the analytical piece of me that says that's exactly the opposite direction that the game's gone. You know, the lowest percentage shot trying to dump it down into the uh, into the post uh, every trip down the floor. 
uh, figuring out how they balance that. Uh, I, I think, you know, if you want to say pitch this old man game concept, but tell me that we're going to have all sorts of pick and roll, pick and pop action that's going to come off of it, uh, that we're going to be able to utilize the high post as a, uh, you know, kind of as an intersection for, for cutters, uh, for screening to get some guys, you know, some better looks than what they're going to be able to get off the dribble without assistance. Um, then, then, yeah, I guess I'm here for it. Uh, but part of that too is contingent on, can we, you know, can we, a shoot the, the, the three ball at a non-historically bad rate? Um, you know, can we continue to get high quality inside looks or at least two point looks, uh, where they've been most effective over the Archie tenure? Um, I, I guess we'll see. The one thing I think I like most about this, this setup, at least on paper is I think it does give Archie a lot of matchup versatility, uh, I, I think the personnel he has is going to give them a lot of different looks, even kind of within the same construct, whether it be, you know, a three guard set, uh, you know, I'm really, really intrigued to see what Jerome Hunter brings to the offense. Uh, I, I think having that guy that can work the baseline, that can stretch the defenses, um, that can play above the rim is absolutely going to be an integral part. And I think that was one of the big things this team was missing last year, uh, to be totally honest with you, it was kind of that slasher. Uh, who could keep defenses honest, who could give you another passing option. Um, it just opens up a whole lot more things when you're trying to play the inside-out type of ball that Archie Shoney wants to do with this with this team. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll see where we'll, – we'll, I guess I, I need to see it really in action. I need to see it in practice. I need to see you know, who fills what roles when we give different looks. Um, I, I think the one thing I would caution all of the speculation on – is oftentimes uh, it's probably going to have to involve some defensive assessment as well. I mean, these guys are going to have to prove that they're not a liability when we go back onto the other end of the floor, uh, because I think that's going to be absolutely an, an imperative for this team. Is yes, we need to be you know become a lot better at scoring the basketball, but you cannot sacrifice you know your defensive effectiveness in order to achieve it. Uh, and I think you look over in, in Memorial at the football team right now, and it, it's okay to have a less than you know than a lead offense but your defense can't regress at the same time that the offense is trying to figure itself out. So uh, I I guess we'll see. I I think to your point, it's a combination of personnel and offense. You know, is it small lineup, big lineup? Who's going to play the three? Is Hunter going to play the three? Does Justin play any three, which kind of gives me a little bit of pause. Um, And and, and are you going to play a couple bigs together? I think that's going to affect the offense. I do like the fact that there's going to be some movement off the ball. Galen, just something that I think is interesting. Uh, a, a not half bad comp for IU's offense last year was actually Duke. Uh, and, and you know, if you look at Duke and what they did last year, they shot the three very poorly. In fact, percentage wise, they shot worse than Indiana did. And free throw wise, they weren't much better. They shot like two or three percentage points better. Uh, they shot the ball from two very well. But what Duke did last year that made them so effective offensively was that they rebounded the ball on the offensive boards. And that's something that IU did fairly well in Archie Miller's first year. And then they basically abandoned last year. So it'll be interesting with, you know, three functional big men plus Justin Smith, who can certainly rebound. Does IU crash the offensive boards more versus what they did last year where they were, they looked like they were backing off and focusing almost entirely on transition defense. I think particularly if you're not hitting threes, you know, crashing the boards like that can generate additional offensive possessions, can extend offensive possessions. And that, frankly, can be the difference in terms of, you know, we only went 18 or 19 versus you went 21 or 22. I, I think I can't, I, I can't agree with both of you more than saying it, it. Looking at one aspect, you need to look at defense as well, because it's really going to depend on who can guard, and especially some of those bigs out on the perimeter. I think it is really important to be able to do that on the other end and then design some offense. So um, we're going to move forward now to our third segment, and coming up in our third segment, uh, we'll answer your questions, including one from our main host, Jared. So stick with us here on The Assembly Call. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. I'm the coach, Brian Tonsoni. And I never miss a shot or an episode of the Assembly Call. 
Uh, so welcome back to Assembly Call. I'm the coach, Brian Tonsoni, and I interrupt a great player, uh, Jordan Hall. So we'll just keep that in here. Um, I'm back with Chronic Hoosier and Galen Clavio. I knew there was going to be a slip up at some point uh, with this soundboard. But remember, you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out a weekly IU news roundup even during the off season, And after every game, we send out a detailed post-game analysis. Just text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. That's IU to 66866. Six six or go to assemblycall.com. It's time now for our mailbag. All questions were submitted via our private IU basketball discussion community, assemblycall.com backslash community. And we are uh, running a little short of time, so we're going to go to uh, our host, Jared Morris, uh, the question that he wanted to answer or ask all of us, and that was about who has the best tailgate between the three of us. And I, I think that's difficult because I think all three of us have unique um, – we have unique uh, setups for our um, tailgate situation. And um, so I'm proud of the bar that we have and the, and the pub tables. And, and I'm proud of the, uh, uh, I'm proud of the pub table and, and just the, the signs I have. So I, I think that's unique and, and I think that's pretty good. But uh, Chronic uh, or Galen, what, what do you do well? Um, we, uh, you know, we just try to set it up and it's almost like a picnic in tailgate form. we got a nice grassy area. We try to get the grill going early. We try to, we take advantage of the breakfast side of the tailgate because unfortunately IU football games, they've decided they all have to start at noon, which I think is a little bit unfortunate. And, uh, and then, you know, we've got great people that, that stop by as I know you do with yours as well, but it's, you know, look, I, I think what we just try to do is warm the spirit as much as possible for people that are planning on going into Memorial Stadium on a weekly basis. And, and, and Chronic, what makes uh, your tailgate so special? Well, I, I think I consider myself an Indiana tailgate traditionalist. Uh, my tailgates usually consist of um, meat and probably some chips and, and just a bunch and a bunch and a bunch of liquor. Um <laughs> There's always going to be at least a handle of Jameson. I've got I've got two milk crates, uh, you know, the old plastic cubes that I keep just with bottles for tailgates. Uh, the Jameson will rotate out just because of the constant replenishment. Um, but I, I have my own tailgating bar that is always crated and ready for rapid deployment. So uh, that, that's kind of what we do best. Um, we, we just we drink a lot of liquor. Uh, and, and beer. I try to bring a lot of beer as well because something's got to wash the chips and the meat down um, when you're not doing shots. Uh, no, I will say, though, seriously, no matter how you choose to tailgate, this is this is the apex of Indiana tailgate season right now. We are living in the golden times of the football calendar. Uh, humidity is down. Temperatures are cool in the morning. Sun still warms in the afternoon. Pretty much the idyllic time on uh, on on Seventeenth Street to be out there. No matter how you do it, who you're doing it with, uh, it's it's really this period right now on the schedule that that I think when everybody looks back and you know reflect upon your IU football, your tailgating memories, it's these days right now, this part of the schedule that we think about. So no matter how you do it, do it big because these are the days, friends. I, I think everyone should should uh, stop by all of our tailgates. We have about forty seconds, so real quick question. Uh, what one Bloomington restaurant no longer around do you miss the most? And we got about 30 seconds chronic real quick. McCree's. And uh, Galen, uh, the restaurant that is not around uh, that you miss the most. Also McCree's. OG McCree's for the record. Yeah, the, the, the one over by Kroger. Yeah, absolutely. Gr- uh, course, honorable mention to Grisanti's, however. And, and, mm-hmm. and real quick, shout out. Um, happy, happy that Yogi's is coming back. And do, do we have a date real quick? Uh, I heard October, and I'm going to reserve my enthusiasm until I actually experience it. I think the space could be really good. Uh, it's kind of how they deploy it and, and what the menu looks like and, and more than anything, too, what the crowd looks like because uh, that, was, that was always like That's my it. We're done. Here. No more questions. Sorry to cut you off, Chronic, but we have to go. And, well, that'll do it for this week. On uh, the Assembly Call, if you want to see us do a, the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to Bob Thompson for producing most of the music you hear on this show, and thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next Thursday night.
Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim and go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. The first time. And then kind of stepping back and looking at him like, we just did that and this is where we are. And to see where it's come from, it's it's uh it's pretty darn cool. And the fact that people still like to join in um makes it all the better. And you know, from a personal standpoint, there's there's just a lot of awesome people involved in it that I never would have met uh in real life, uh, but for these uh these platforms. So Yeah, it's uh the last four or five years since I've started following Assembly Call, Jared's done just tremendous stuff for me and the interns and getting to meet people like you through through this is just it's helped uh helped as an educator sometimes get through the frustrating times of, of where education has gone uh on, on my end so i appreciate you guys tremendously hey speaking of education uh galen who's the stars this year who's the one that uh for, on your side with the kids that we I mean, been watching uh, i mean sam niederman i think is is uh definitely the leader in the clubhouse there he's a pro um, and uh and we got Mary Kate Hamilton, uh, who's doing a little bit of sideline now. We're we're having an interesting. We're doing a lot of men's basketball games. Uh, who's your hysteria next weekend? And then we've got Gannon, and then we've got at least two regular season games, if not more than that. And we got some pretty talented kids that are going to be doing those broadcasts. So uh, so keep an eye out. I tell you, Galen, they they do a great job. Thanks. Just, just a great job. Oh, uh, I pass that along to them. It means a lot. I know when. The, it's the it's the funny thing when you're a student broadcaster or a student writer, you never think anybody's looking at your stuff or listening to your stuff. And um, like these kids are in an interesting spot because this is like the first era where you you know that people are. And I think they they certainly handle the pressure a lot more and a lot better than I would have at that same age. Uh, it's uh, I remember the first time someone called into my WIUS show, I I was I freaked out like uh, it, was, it was hard to handle. So. They're they're very very good. No, it used to be that was only for prank calls. Right. Yes. The, the WIS hotline was only for like your roommates or some of your buddies that would call in and prank. <laughs> I, I made a lot of those phone calls in my day. I remember it. Oh yeah. So uh, thoughts leading up, um, real quick. We we just keep this going for a little bit. Whenever you guys need to leave, leave. Um, I need to get the uh, video or audio cut and set to Jared. But um, we gonna be I, happy at the end of the year, real quick. I'll say this. Um, <laughs> a lot of it depends on what their record is in the non-conference. Uh, there is a legitimate chance they're going to go 11 and 0 in the non-conference. Like I, I think that they could legitimately win every single game. And if you do that, you can go nine and 11 in the conference season and still make the tournament. I think mm-hmm. relatively easily. Um, if they lose one, then, you know, getting to 10 and 10, I, I, I really think the big 10 is going to be weird because so much of the projections rely on Penn state, being really good, Rutgers being really good, and Iowa being like okay, and then Illinois being like a top fifteen team. Like I don't know if any of those predictions are going to be correct. And uh, so I think if Indiana can play really good defense and they can find some scoring, there's no reason they can't you know be somewhere between nine and eleven wins. And I think that as long as there's no catastrophes in the non-conference, that'll get them in the tournament. Yeah, I, I, I think twenty is the magic number from a bracketology perspective uh depending on what 20 though uh you got to get some good wins uh in there um but yeah they need they can't one loss i I, maybe two in the in the non-conference but nothing more than that um yeah they got to make hay in the non-conference i agree no it's you you know i I understand a lot of the fans perspective that you want to play you know you want those marquee matchups if ever there were a season for one that's a little less than stellar i think this is absolutely it for these guys if nothing else too early on just so that you can you can kind of toy with the rotation a little bit and figure out situationally who do you want and what spots win you know who maybe is the one guy that might not be there in November, December, but come February and March, you could see him being more, um, more impactful, a bigger contributor. Uh, but God, just managing the load on these guys. Cause again, I, I still continue to think, you know, you're an injury, you're a Devante or a Rob injury away from the wheels falling off on this team. Um, and you know, at least getting through the non-conference as un- unscathed as you can, uh, not just record wise, but health wise. Uh, cause I, 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 and 
<laughs> I need to, I need to better articulate. I need to write this down. I still continue to absolutely loathe the, the, the big 10 games before the, the first semester is done. I, I cannot stand it with all of my, my existence. Um, but there's just something about that getting past new year's with, with a healthy roster um, that's close to a hundred percent, I, I, I think is, is always important, but it just puts such a premium on that this year because who knows what the conference is going to shake out to be. I'm, I'm still kind of offended by some of the preseason rankings, but I can totally understand where they're coming from as well. Um, it, at the same time though, you know, it's, it's going to be awful tough to be a top five team in this league this year with what I think I is going to be bringing to the table. Uh, but at the end of the day, how much of a difference is between four and 10? Anybody's guess. I was going to say, we didn't put this on the show because we just did offense and personnel, but, and I'm the, one of the biggest Archie Miller fans around, but he can't have another Minnesota uh, episode where he, you know, he, he writes the ship after a big blowout. I, I think he's got to be a little tougher and demand some more. And some of that's personnel based, I think. Um, but I think maybe he tried from afar. I'm not there to be too much of a player's coach, maybe, uh, and smooth the difference personalities and everything. And then after Minnesota, he had that, whatever happened, happened. And, and well, they played really well after that. And I think we just got to be more consistent on that level from the coaching uh, standpoint. I, uh, I actually think it's more the opposite. I think, really? Uh, I mean, from the standpoint that everything I've heard, it's more along the lines of, well, they uh, like – Archie does not particularly believe in this idea that like, he should be like making sure guys are playing hard. Like that's just something that should be expected at this level. And and that I think was a real problem right. up to that Minnesota game. And, and I think that what to some degree righted the ship at the very tail end was that, you know, they got back to those sorts of fundamentals, which they shouldn't have needed to, like that should have been hardwired into the team. And I think it was to a certain degree. Like I think they were playing that way, uh, early on in the season, I think you saw that with uh, with some, like the, the Northwestern win in the non-conference or in the in the early conference and stuff like that. But um, they didn't handle adversity. To... They didn't handle adversity no. very well. They they kind of pouted when they got punched. And, uh, at times. and there were and, and and as and as Jay has pointed out in a lot of our chats, there were a lot of injuries and there were a lot of things that were difficult. But there, I just think it was there. There wasn't a lot of player leadership that was that was clear on the team last year. And that probably was unavoidable given the roster composition and the way that everything fit together. And that's not an indictment of any one player. It's more just kind of how things just played out. And so, look, I think this year's team doesn't have much of a margin for error. You know, and that's that's ultimately going to be the big question is, can the can the whole be greater than the sum of the parts? Because last year it was the opposite. And um, you know, if they're if they're gonna claw into the tournament as an eight or a nine seed or something like that, um, then that's that's gonna be what has to happen. But I would remind everybody that the year that Indiana beat Kentucky with the watch shot game and made it to the sweet sixteen was was a that was a year where the team came into the season and everybody was projecting an NIT bid. Because everybody's like, oh, this team's at least a year away from being able to compete and all of that. Like, that's gotten lost in the sands of time. Um, you know, and I think you find out the most about coaches and programs in years where the expectations are, are low to some degree. It's also a team that had two lottery players on it. Which no one knew at the time. Like, I mean, Victor Oladipo was coming off of a season where... No, was Victor was totally out of, out of the blue, but I think Cody was... Well, well yeah. sure, but I mean, but everybody thought Cody was surrounded by guys who weren't enough. Like, kind of... Um, yeah, I, I, cer- I certainly thought the preseason projections that year were underrating that team, given the talent that was there. Uh, and certainly in hindsight, it looks silly. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm just saying that that was not a lot of people expected much of, out of that team going into the season. It wasn't until that NC State game when everybody was like, hey, there might be something here. No, oh, and that's the thing I fucking hate about this schedule is because we're going to play our first, our first true road game is also our first conference game, which yeah. happens before the Watt shot game did on the on the calendar. Right. It's, it's hey, just it's so wonky that way. We we can stay talking. I <laughs> I just think I shut off the the live streaming, so I don't think anyone's watching us anymore. Uh, I was just I was just <laughs> trying to wrap up everything, and I I said, oh my gosh, was I sh- supposed to shut that off? Or just pause the recording and I shut it off and then I thought, you dumbass. That's no no one's watching us anymore, I don't think. So 
Uh, no I'll worries. let you guys go. Um, uh, you have it definitely off. So, okay. Yeah, well, hey, it's definitely hey, off. Good job with everything. I thought it went really well. And well, I, um, I appreciate you guys coming on. And uh, yeah, uh, like I said, I'm glad I can help Jared out with this. And um, hopefully, I did. A, I did a halfway decent job. But it was a pleasure talking to you guys. It always is. And we'll see you down around Bloomington sometime. See Likewise, you at homecoming. Man. All have right. Good night, guys. Peace. Take it easy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I screwed up two things though. Oops, wait a minute. I'm still I'm still taping here.